I'm Sawyer, and you're listening to Our House A to Z. We're back from vacation. Hey. Now we're back. Welcome back, Our House friends and family. And we're not sunburned. We're not sunburned. Pretty, pretty tan. Although, no matter what, I feel like I could come back like 20 shades darker and people's like, where are your tan at? Why do people always do that? I don't know. It's like their favorite thing. It's their like, favorite thing. You're not tan. I'm like, no, I'm not. I know. Because that is not. That is one of the favorite things. Like anytime we've come back from anything, people ask about the tan. Yeah. You're like, well, I mean, we have children. We do other things besides like literally just oil our bodies and lay out in the sun. I know. That, <laughs> I always think of like the- Like, you know what age we are, right? I We're know, not like I, I 50 the, where the, we don't have the seniors kids to be in, responsible in for. The Boca that live in the condos and they like just lay out and they just get like leathery. Like, yeah, exactly. We're like, like, is that what everybody's hoping for when we come back from vacation? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. No, so, it's not going to happen. The proof um, is in the pudding. But what did happen on vacation, it was a magical vacation. Oh, no. So one way to put it. Magically. We started off the travel day by Willa vomiting. Oh, yeah. So she puked the entire car ride. The entire car ride. You like every vomiting, 15 minutes. Like she did it once, but it was literally like nonstop. Nonstop. Like hurling the entire For six hours. Trip. So yeah. that was special. Um, We're like pulling over in places to like empty the bowl yep. and like wash it out. So, so that, that was, was d- awesome. that was the travel day up there. And then we had our very first day. Willa had a fever. For the day, Messer was sick. and a sore throat, and then and then Finn got his arm broken that night. Yeah, day one, awesome, just like that. So as far as lake activities go, that was kind of a damper for poor Finn, and yeah. pretty much anything else he wanted to do on vacation. Yeah, he wanted to golf with me, and his arm ended up in a cast sling brace thing splint. That's it. Yeah, all the way up past the elbow for the week. So we cut vacation Happy short. Happy vacation, a couple days short. We cut it a couple days short. We came back. We went to the river. Thank you, Dr. Littlefield. Yep. Got that thing braced up good because there's something special about doing it in a backwoods main hospital. <laughs> you know, where they're like treating horses in the same No, they're room. not. No, yeah. but they didn't have all the stuff for pediatric sizing and all that stuff. It's anyway. All like hunters who were shot and they're like, you know, Oh my gosh, no. But it was still a good vacation. It was nice. Just not how we expected it, but isn't that life? Right. Isn't that just I mean, how often do we just like think things are going to go a certain way and they don't go according to our plans? Right. So So how do you feel like you handle things not going according to plan? Because you're not like an Uber planner, which is interesting to me. You're not really like trying to plan out your next few weeks and your days and all that kind of stuff. no. No, definitely not. But when things don't happen like how you want them to happen how do you feel like you do with that uh not well yeah not well yeah i think it's it's not so much a plan as it is a picture in my head so like an expectation kind yeah. of like what we talked about on here yeah so if i have an expectation and then it doesn't i'm like very mad at whoever disrupted that right and so i spent a lot of the week mad you did yeah but i also read like two and a half books which is <laughs> very because you were mad uncommon <laughs> Yeah. So he stayed to himself for the entire week and read. And I never really read, but you got me turned on to some good books. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, all right, I'm just, I can, I'm not going to say anything I regret if I don't say anything at all. Thanks, mom, for that life lesson. Uh-huh. And uh, so I read and I read and I read and I read. And you read and you read and you read. Do you feel rested? Yep. Good. I feel great. That's great. Although I'm always like, I'm the guy that like, likes to get home from vacation too. I'm not the like, I would just stay on vacation forever. Right. Where you have the kids that are like, can we just move here? And yeah. You're like, you know, that loses the whole effect of vacation if I you know. move here, right? I know. Yeah. It's they true. always ask that. There's always like two kids that are like, what do you think about moving here? <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, it's hard not to think about it. I mean, I remember being in St. Thomas and we met somebody at like one of the little beach like sailboat rental places or something. And they're, it's just like New England people that go to on vacation and then they're like, yeah, we should just We're stay We're just here. staying down here. And then they stay and yep. you're like, oh, okay. I think those are the people that can afford that. Like they're just like quitting their jobs and they had so much money that they just uh, but they're still like moved to working. an island. They're still like they have to get a job on the island. You Do know? they? Unless they're they just do it for fun. Yeah, but you're right. I don't think that that's an ideal place. I mean, I I just listen to people in Newport talk about like how the summer is because it's so touristy. Yeah, and it's like so. It doesn't seem like fun. It doesn't seem fun. It's like it takes like an hour to drive what normally takes 15 minutes oh, because of tourist traffic. traffic yeah. yeah, summer traffic. Oh, it's terrible. I don't want to live in a touristy place. No, I don't either. So. I don't either. Not that Maine is touristy. Not the 
the not, entire not, state of Maine not is not touristy. Much no. But but it was still overall nice, little getaway, and back to the real world. Yes. I, I think that's it. where everybody is. I feel like over the summer it's so fun because everybody has like little trips and stuff planned, mm. but everybody's so scattered. It feels like you miss so many people. You don't see so many people. They're gone the opposite days, I and know. you don't cross paths with all the same people and being out of routine. I love the fall. That's why I, I love you the do. fall. I love everybody coming back in. I, I remember being It's too in early school. to talk about the fall. It's too early to talk okay. about it. Yeah, you got to wait. A, it's a long way It's only way the first away. week of August. It's a long way away. So long. Yeah. We got another solid month of summer. Yep. It's going to be great. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. All right, good. So today we're going to talk about... Stewardship. 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 It's very biblical. It's such like an old school sounding word, isn't it? Stewardship. I'm bringing it back. I think we still use it. It shouldn't be just old school. I don't think it should be old school either. But why does this... I think just the word sounds old. Yeah. Like be a good steward. We had some people when we were talking about um, doing the fivefold thing, people were like that saying fivefold gifts sounds so like old school. And to me it doesn't at all because I didn't associate it with like the 1980s or whenever people started using it that way but um i get it i get it that it's like you know has that like antiquated old language feel i know we need new language around it but for now we're just gonna stay stewardship because stewardship stewardship steward not like Stuart. Stuart? which is one of our kids thought it was Stuart. what does mama say about little boys who talk dirty stewardship yeah or it was like be a good steward little boys who talk dirty grow up to be Democrats. Do you know what the definition of stewardship is? No. Do you want me to look it up? Nope. I feel like I should for okay. a clear understanding. What do you think? What is it? Ooh, this what? says a job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. Okay, there you go. Stewardship. Can you hear that clearly so you know how to pronounce it? Stewardship. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, wow, now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Now I know that I've been saying it right all these years. (laughs) Thank you for that confirmation. Thank you, Google pronunciation. Uh, I got on the thought of stewardship recently because I think we've talked on here a lot about expectations and we talk often about how so many like issues and problems are related to like selfishness and how we're always so concerned about how things affect us yep. or we can only see ourselves in situations. And that's why expectations are hard because we're disappointed in how we thought things should be or we're disappointed in somebody because how they chose to respond or something they chose to do. And how it affects us. And it started me thinking about that and about the idea of stewardship because our minds are so trained to be self-focused that it's hard to look at the finances you've been given, the home you've been given, the family you've been given, your children, your community, any resources that you have, and not be wondering how they serve you. And I think it's it's super unintentional and it's super subconscious. But I think as just Americans, like modern Americans, we tend to to not steward the way that the Lord wants us to steward, but steward how we deem things should be stewarded because they're our possessions and our things. Mm. So I just started thinking about it and I thought we should talk about it a little bit. I think that's great. I mean, so you're saying there's a difference between stewarding what's yours and stewarding just something that you're responsible for. That's like not really yours. Well, I think it's, I think it's more so that how you define stewardship, because somebody could say I'm stewarding all these things really well for the purpose of serving me, or I could steward these things really well for the purpose of serving my legacy, Mm. or I could steward these things really well according to how the Lord wants me to steward these things. And those can all be very different things. Like, yes, they can be one and the same too. Like, I think you can steward something and it be a blessing to you and a blessing to generations to come yeah. and a blessing to the church community that you're part of. Yeah. Um, well, some people, I, I think, you know, some people will say, well, stewardship is so that you can bless the max amount of like people. They, they, they make it about like quantity. Like, okay. can you do the most for the most number of people or whatever is that? And I, I don't necessarily that think that that's what it is always. I think it can be that, right. but I think that that's, you know, I, I, or, okay, well, the best stewardship is how do you make it last the longest? Mm-hmm. That's another way to like measure stewardship is like, well, you know, if we're stewarding this well, then it will never go away. It will never run out. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you think here, environmental people talk about like the earth, you know, and stewarding the earth and the natural resources that are here. And, 
you know, wildlife and things like that, or just your personal finances. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we've got to come up with a way to measure the success of stewardship. Because like you said, somebody may be thinking, okay, I'm stewarding this well, but really you're just being super selfish with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I just keeping in the forefront of your mind, every time you have something, whether it's, whether it is finances or, you know, I think kids is a great example because we all have plans for our kids. We all have hopes and dreams for them. And constantly going back to the fact that the Lord gave them to you for you to literally steward mm. in the time that they're like under your roof. I think that that is an, an eye opener to how self-focused we can be and small minded we can be with our kids. Especially when it comes to things like our kids making choices that can you stop moving your feet or you can't put them here because it's shaking my chair too much. Oh, sorry. Um, I think when Got it comes restless to leg syndrome. you definitely have restless leg syndrome. <laughs> Sorry. When it comes to making choices or our kids making choices that hurt us. And, you know, I've seen this, I've seen this before and like thinking about different seasons where parents either don't want their kids to maybe go on a mission strip or go to college or go because there's a feeling of like how that affects me. Like that's going to hurt me. That's going to. I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to worry, worry all the, all these things that we want to avoid. Stop moving. Sorry. I'm trying to get comfortable. Okay. Now I'm too distracted. Why? I'm too distracted because I can't talk at the same time and watch you dance all over Is the it because place. Because if I sit at this angle, you can see it in my shorts. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely not. Oh, uh, okay. You don't even know what I'm saying now. You don't even know what I'm yes, talking I do. about. You're talking about. People. Don't say just stewardship. No, it's a, I. I get what you're saying about people are like, especially when it comes to their loved ones. I don't want to just say people. I know I can be like I can. I have to fight that in myself all the time. Like, give me an example of a time you've had to fight it in yourself. Oh gosh, I'm not good at coming up with examples. I'm that so fast. Okay. Well. The good news is Ben can delete all this <laughs> empty space while you're trying to think of that. Uh, yeah. So in in that account where you're saying, oh, I don't want my kid to go to college or I don't want them to go on a mission strip or whatever, marry that to the stewardship piece. Is it because those kids are yours to steward? Yeah. And so you're saying, no, I'd rather keep you at home. Is that like the, the guy burying the talon? Maybe. I think it can be. Because when you bury your talents, then you have to answer when the master returns, like, what did you do? Well, how did you invest your whatever? I know, but I feel like we just have, we have really good, like, reasons for everything. And there can be reasons, like, we would want our kids to stay home mm -hmm. and safe under a roof because of other things that we might be fearful of or trying to, like, protect them in a way. So we can look at that and think, oh, like, this is no the right thing to do. But I feel like the right way to steward is constantly asking the Lord, like, what does he see for your kids? Like, what are his, like, greatest aspirations and hopes for your kids? Because it's going to be greater than anything you want or anything you're hoping for. But because we get so focused on, like, the day-to-day, -day, like, the everyday, mm. it's hard to, like, look beyond that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, And kids are just an example. I think in long term is, like, really the 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 biggest crux of stewardship mm -hmm. i think you know it's it, you're you know what does dave ramsey say but like you're gonna you're gonna go without things today so that you can you you live do, like no one else so you can live like no one else yeah like live like no one else today so you can live like no one else like yeah. in your retirement basically so it's i think stewardship is playing the long game you know not just in the sense of how long we can get our money to last but like how is the return yeah. How great is the return? And to me, that is the rubric. That is the litmus test of stewardship is the return. Right. Because we're entrusted with all sorts of things, you know? And um, I know, you know, since since we've moved in, to me, one of the big examples is our this space, this mm -hmm. mall that we're in right now. And since we've moved in, so we had always gone with like, no space like it was always we were like maxed out every corner we were stuffing kids in like closets trying to create um classrooms and 
you know, places without, you know, heating and cooling and places that leaked and, you know, just doing anything that we could to like keep church going and whatever yep. tiny hole in the wall storefront space we had. And when we moved here, there was suddenly like more room than we knew what to do with. And I, I, I love the vision of so many of the folks in leadership here and how we've just kind of had this open door policy almost not entirely but almost to where we've brought ministries in we've said oh sure you know you can come here ministries that were getting evicted from the places they were in or they were they didn't have a space they wanted to start they needed like a launch pad and so it was like okay you know and to the point where we had stuff happening like in the loading dock stock room we had Mm -hmm. we had meetings taking place in you know random former dressing rooms you know that were the macy's Macy's dressing (laughs) room what kind of things were happening in the dressing room the the fitting rooms and and uh i love it and there it it's sort of an inconvenience but i i see it as also like how do you stand before the lord and say right what was the return? Right. Because, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. And I think the more that God gives you, you know, the more blessed you feel, but the more responsibility you should feel. Mm-hmm. Because because the Lord is expecting a return on that. Right. And if you're stewarding something well, then it will have a big return. Yeah. You know? I know. And I can fight that. Sometimes I get frustrated you know, when I think about like the church stuff, because there is always this balance of like, we're trying to steward things well, but you want to like share everything with anybody that needs it. And, you know, we talk about that with other ministries, like Zach was saying, like whatever we have, like, Hey, other churches like borrow it and we're here. And then there are some things that you're like, Oh, well it, it's fine. If we don't, if somebody wants to borrow the chairs until they're like not there on Sunday. <laughs> and so you're constantly in this battle of, mm-hmm. How do you like steward well, but like be really responsible and make good choices? And I don't know. I think it's challenging. I know. Well, I think you have all the super spiritual people who will always say, well, you know, if if somebody steals all the chairs, then they were meant to be there and not here. You know, our church should just stand instead of sit down and whatever. They're more spiritual than me. That's for sure. Well, it's funny because I get it. I get holding everything with an open hand and knowing that, you know, everybody talks about like, oh, the Nikki Cruz thing from crossing the switchblade when, you know, he lets these opposing gang leaders take up the offering and, you know, and, and I, th- I think that that was like this really cool sort of, you know, illustration, but I feel like if, if they had stolen the offering that night, my guess is that David Wilkerson probably wouldn't just keep having them take up the offering at right. every service. Right. It's like God, God was cl- clearly wanted to, use that as an opportunity and David Wilkerson took a huge risk in like extending that Mm -hmm. but I also feel like you see places where the Lord is careful and understanding of like look at what does he do with the what does he do with the scraps after he feeds 5,000 he says collect all the Mm -hmm. leftovers up yep so what does that mean it means that the Lord wanted to be a good steward of even what was left over even the scraps he's a steward of and to me, when I when I read things like that, I'm thinking, okay, if there's a corner, if there's a crust of the bread, if there's a, a corner of the building, if there's a room, mm-hmm. you know, that, that can be used and what is it costing us? Like the electric bill, you know, that yeah. was going to be a mile high anyway. Right. Um, we, we don't really have a choice but to hold that up to the Lord. Now, the second that that is getting abused or misused or vandalized or you know, whatever it's being destroyed. Yeah. Um, now, now that is no longer, you just cross the line from being a good steward to being a bad steward. Cause now right. it's not being taken care of, Right. you know, that's good. All right. So what about in personal finances? Because this is one that I do think needs a perspective shift. And for those of you who might have grown up Christian, I think it's easy to go right to the, the tithe is the Lord's, you know? And so it's kind of, we, separate this 10% Mm -hmm. and say, all right, financially 10% of what comes in belongs to the Lord. And I can be super, um, stringent about that. I can be super faithful in that and know that that's like the right thing and believe in my heart. And I might even say, okay, 15%, I'm going to tithe 15% plus I give to missionaries and I support a child in Guatemala and all of these things. 
but we draw this line that says those things are like the Lord's money and then I have like my money. And how do we like shift our perspective? Are there practical ways that you would say, how do you shift your perspective to say, not the 10% and the 15% are not the Lord's, but everything is the Lord's. I tithe and give offering and all of that kind of things with a portion of my finances, but I see it all as the Lord. So even when it comes to how much I spend on whatever it is, a house or groceries or clothing, it's all the Lord's and he should be the one. When I'm spending money, I should look to him for like the approval yeah. of how I'm spending that. Mm. Cause you could spend 15%. You could say, okay, 15% is the Lord's and then you're gambling away the rest of it. And it's like, but I'm honoring the Lord with my 15%. Right. And it's like, no, everything's the Lord's. Right. So how do, how do you do that? Cause it's so hard. Well, I don't think, I mean, contrary to some, I don't know if how popular the opinion is anymore these days, but like, you know, there was a time when people thought if you were a good Christian that you were like living in poverty. Yeah. Um, and I don't actually think that's good stewardship either. I, I don't think that, I think, I think you can, out of compassion or sentiment or sympathy, you can give everything away that you have and then not be able to pay your bills. Right. And I don't think that's good stewardship. Right. I don't think just recklessly giving things away. I, I think that the Lord wants you to have enough to sustain yourself and and live a life that's indicative and reflective of his blessing. I agree. So I just, I feel like all of these truths are so easily manipulatable mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we have to be really careful to know, okay, God doesn't want you, I feel like the Lord doesn't want us like blowing everything now so then in power in, in our retirement years right we're really struggling you mm -hmm. know and i know that that is the case for a lot of people and maybe they got saved later in life or maybe they their finances got into alignment later in mm -hmm. life or whatever and so things are rough but i mean to our generation now it's like okay make decisions that are that are playing the long game right like work work from that angle of what do you want this to look like at the end what do you want to leave your kids stewardship is irrevocably tied to legacy mm -hmm. um and i think that the more we're conscious of the generations after us and even if you don't have kids and you're never going to have kids there's you're still responsible for a legacy yeah you're still responsible for how what the return is on your investment. Right. You know? All right. So another thing, so we had a few different topics, but um, one I wanted to hit before we run out of time is, is actually time, ironically enough, is time and stewarding your time. How do you steward your time? Ooh, so well. I'm like, I'm kind of an expert at this, honestly. I'm a little bit of a guru. So actually, ten, so no, I'm notorious about time, but I feel like I've I've made some decisions that, aren't haven't made me real popular but I, it's definitely brought a lot of my time into a better management mm -hmm. so better stewardship what do you think that people can do to look at their time and say like hey i need to steward this better or like why is time so important in general i don't know i think you should have kim on here to talk about it because she did <laughs> kim, kim gagney just did a really great presentation to our staff um about time management and, in, in the workplace specifically stewardship mm-hmm and uh, in the workplace, yeah, that's true. And it was so good because she comes from a very like corporate understanding of, you know, the value of time, mm -hmm. which is something that as believers, I think sometimes we can fudge, we can live in a gray area. Yeah. Just knowing like, okay, not only does every dollar I have belong to the Lord, but so does every minute. Mm -hmm. And the Lord doesn't want us like scrounging around for time. Did you read that book, The, the Bible? The Reckless... Um, eradication of hurry or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, I did. Did you? Mm -hmm. How was it? It was great. Yeah. Was Would like, you promote it here? Is that John Mark Comer? Yeah. Is that who did that book? Yeah. I would promote it. I thought it was a great book. I thought it was great. It talks a lot about Sabbath um, and the importance of Sabbath. And I thought it was great. Cool. I would definitely recommend that book. I can't remember if I recommended it a few years ago when I read it on here. It's possible. But did you? Well, when you talk about the stewardship of time, I think of how poor stewards of time often look like that they look hurried yeah so i think that's to me that's more of like when i f that yeah that, hurry, that's more of a hurried and also me. i I, c I can see it as just m like messy for some mm. reason i think we run out of time because it's kind of like you know you've talked about it 
as as being like having holes in your pockets, like money with like holes in your pockets, because yeah. it's just you're losing it everywhere. Yeah. And I kind of shared with the staff a little bit about that, like just even being a mom and a wife and trying to steward your time well at home, because it's so easy to kind of buy into a culture that is Netflix binging and me, me, me and self-care and self-care and self-care. And yeah. there's so much truth to that, that self-care really is important and it's not worth like trying, like killing yourself to try to f- meet everybody's needs. Mm. And then you're unhealthy and miserable and like not fed spiritually. Like, no, of course not. But how to, how do you like do it and not feel like you have to do it all, Yeah. but do it, do what you're doing like well. I think it's it's living in a living in a good space between your your self and you're aware of like what is healthy like for you and also the fact that you are responsible to play a part in a bigger thing. Right. Um and and knowing, you know, somebody somebody a young lady just emailed me and I emailed her back this morning about um but we were on vacation so sorry about that for getting back too late. Um about you know, uh, something that she's been a part of a ministry that she's been a part of for years. And there was a time when that ministry really spoke and invested into her life. And now she sort of feels this like long term sort of like obligation to give back to it, Um, which I guess is good. I think that's good. Like we should feel that sense of like gratefulness and, you know, and paying it forward and that sort of thing. But um, in this case, it's like, okay, okay, well, what about when you're dealing with a a person or a thing who is just on the take? Yeah. And it's constantly like, okay, your email box and your actual paper mailbox out in front of your house is like constantly full of requests for time, for money, for whatever it is, you name it. And um, and I I told her, I said, listen, because she was saying, you know, it's like, it's like, there's no end to the ask. Yeah. It's just the take. Like, yeah. okay, now it's this. Now we need you to show up and staff this. Now we need you to invest here. Now we need this. And I was like, you know, I said, I'm at a place where I'll pray about about that before I ever am asked. Or like, as I'm getting asked, you stop, you ask what the Lord really wants from you for that. And then you never open another piece of mail. Yeah. Like you never open another email from from that ministry because why because you already heard from the lord what your involvement and investment is supposed to be and if you really heard from the lord then why is anybody else weighing in on that you know it's like well here's what's healthy here's what's right and and now that frees me up to like be a man with seven barns i'm going to be invested over here too and i'm going to be poured into over here and i'm going to be involved in this Mm -hmm. and and so i think a lot of times for sentimental reasons, um, our heartstrings are played on, uh, the yeah. guilt card or the obligation card or the expectation card or the manipulation card are played and we end up, uh, you know, staying over invested in things past our expiration date. And so, yeah, I think we've just got to know what's healthy and really pray about that and, and, you know, whoever else we love and trust, whether it's a spouse or a kid or a good friend, a prayer partner, friend say, Hey, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm praying. Does that sound right to you? Right. What Hmm. do you think? I think it's good. I, I think it's so much easier said than said than done, Hmm. you know? Yeah, it absolutely is. But the Lord's got a will on this and, and we don't usually use the phrase, the, you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. That's come up on this podcast many times. We don't often um, use it in this context, but this is a perfect place to use it because we think that for as long as we're making sacrifices, we're good. So you said the 10 or 15 percent tithe and then I can gamble away everything else. Well, what happens when that's extreme, but I'm just saying. Yeah, but okay. so let's say it's 10 or 15 percent tithe. And then I'm on now. I'm also giving another 10% to this thing and 15% to this nonprofit and 20% to this charity and whatever. And let's say you still have enough to live on at the end. That still doesn't mean that it's actually that, that your sacrifice is made in obedience to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because what the Lord may be saying is no, like I want that put in account in an account somewhere. And I'm going to tell you in 10 years where it's going to go. Right. You know? 
So it, it just requires the relationship piece with the Lord. It requires us to stay with our ear to the ground and to know that we know that we know that this is what the Lord wants. It's good. So, yeah, it's tough, right? It is tough. It's tough. It is tough. I and, know. I think often about, and this is kind of seems like far off, but it's not for me because it, it reminded me of it, is like the Mary and Martha story and feeling like, okay, Lord, like how do we, when it comes to stewarding time in particular, looking at that, looking at that situation, you could, you can see, okay, like Mary was doing the right thing. And she, like the Lord said, she was the one who was doing the right thing and not hurry, busy serving, doing all the stuff. And she was just listening and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And like, that was the better thing. But sometimes I look around today and I was just talking to um, another mom about this recently because she was feeling a little bit like in a hard season of missing out, kind of feeling like you're missing out on some of like the spiritual things that are going on while you're home with your kids. And um, she was saying, you know, it just feels frustrating when I have to miss out on like a, a Bible study or a prayer meeting. And I know that there are other like moms that are participating and get to be a part of stuff and I'm home with my kids and it's like you're trying to do the right thing and I don't think that there's a right answer for it but I know how challenging it can be and to look at like the Mary and Martha thing and say okay like is it always going to the prayer meeting that's where we're going to be like closest to the Lord it's like no that's that's I feel like that's kind of what we want to see on a surface level. It's like, okay, well, as long as I'm like worshiping at church, that is going to outrank anything else I can be doing when it comes to stewardship, when it comes to serving the Lord, when it comes to like sitting at his feet. It's like, no, you're called to serve the Lord. You're called to sit at the Lord's feet in different ways in every season. It might not be as like a, for young moms out there, it might not be like, hey, I get to be at every single event and thing that goes on at the church and every like worship night that I want to. Like, no, the Lord's given you children to steward and that is going to take precedent not over your relationship with the Lord, but over like being at church with other people who are doing, who are worshiping or, um, and a lot of times I've seen people who have stewarded it poorly when they're the ones that are at church every week. You're at, you're that church for every time the doors are open, but your kids are falling apart mm. because in that season you feel like you're supposed to be doing this instead of that. And it's not always picking the right. I feel like a lot of times we, we misstep and we pick the wrong, the wrong thing to, I don't want to say steward, but the wrong thing to kind of pour ourselves into. I don't know. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. It does. And, and that's, that's how Sorry, the Red Hot Chili Peppers is kind of like throwing me off or whatever this is. Oh, really? <laughs> Who sings this song? <laughs> hey, I heard Flea got saved. Were you in that conversation? I heard you saying, I heard somebody saying that to you. Somebody said it, which is awesome. Anyway, I think we've got to know the difference between guilt and conviction, you know, because it is good moms like feel guilty about, they feel guilty about doing things for themselves or they feel guilty about doing things without their kids. They feel mm -hmm. bad that they leave their kids home with a babysitter too many nights or that they're, you know, this or that or whatever. And that, but we know where guilt comes from. So you've got to be able to distinguish the difference between guilt and conviction. And if you're feeling convicted, it's ironic because people who have that tendency are usually the ones who it's, it's more of a guilt thing. The people who don't ever feel guilty sometimes have trouble feeling conviction you know and so you've got to know where you err you've got to know yourself really well and if you know that hmm this is something i i have a tendency to do is to feel guilty about this then it's worth taking the time to say uh lord is this really you or is this something that you know just me and my emotions yeah exactly you know so much of it i think as moms for sure it comes out of like our emotions and just yeah. like our feelings on things and it's not actual like conviction or you know yeah it's tough but you know what it just drives us back to the lord and i'm encouraged by that because i feel like the people who i know who are really staying close to the lord not just not just like verbally or you know 
externally or like the ones at the altar during worship or the outspoken whatever um but the ones who are really like living that like quiet and meditative life with the lord Mm -hmm. they're they're winning they're doing it like they're doing it successful they're doing it well um i look at young families young couples in the church it this is not an uh, an inobtainable outcome right you know to do this well and healthy it's like you know, you hear testimonies of people and some of them are on a mic on a Sunday morning and a lot of them are just getting to know people and hearing their stories and saying like, how did you come to where you are now? And come to find out people who are are obedient and who are sensitive and who are really seeking the Lord, like they're rewarded, yeah. they're rewarded for it. So don't be discouraged if you feel like this is an area where you struggle. Uh, use it as ammunition to get yourself into a a closer place with the Lord. And then what I would say is if you're somebody you're like, I I never feel like I hear God talk. I never feel like I, you know, I, everybody talks about hearing God this and hearing God that. And I struggle with that and blah, blah, blah. I know there's a lot of us out there that wrestle with that. Um, I would say experiment. Hmm. I would say, okay, if you've been trying things a certain way, like try them a different way and then don't, don't wait for the sky to open up and, you know, for, you know, angels to sing, look for peace. Hmm. Like if you, if you're trying to please the Lord or do right by your family, by being out a million nights a week and by working four jobs and whatever else, and, and it's it's not bringing peace Mm -hmm. or order to your family, then say, okay, you know what? I'm going to take a season and we're going to do this differently. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to give one of these things up or a couple of these things up and I'm going to make it a point to be at home more. Um, And then look for the peace. Yeah. Look for the peace. And the peace is not in the form of dollar numbers in your bank account. The peace is, okay, this is actually better for my family. Um, and if you're somebody on the other end of that and you're like, okay, I'm at home all the time and I do kids all day and whatever else, like, and there's no peace. Well, try something different, Mm. you know, it's good. So look for the peace. I like it. Look the peace. All right. All right. Why don't you close this out? Lord, help us. We need you. Um, and we were meant to need you. It's not even a bad thing. God, we just need you because we can't figure it out on our own and we're going to mess it up without you, Lord. So we just, um, we just ask for Lord, your wisdom, heavenly wisdom in this area of stewardship and, uh, Lord, whatever it is that we've been entrusted with, whatever it is that we hold God, that we would hold knowing that it was heaven that saw fit to, um, uh, divvy these things up and distribute them. And so, Lord, we um, we want to take everything that we have, everything that we'll ever have, and commit it um, to, to your kingdom and to the heavenly return when those things are invested properly. So we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our house friends and family, thank you for stopping by and we'll see you next Friday on Our House. This is Messer. And I'm Willa. This is Our House from A to Z. Thanks for coming over. Mother. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a rite of passage. Mother, I crave violence. Oh. <laughs>